Part One, Chapter Eight of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1788 to 1789, Eve of the Revolution. My aunt, Madame Denis, received us at her house in the Rue Venet, and gave me quarters on the ground floor, looking out on a very dismal little garden. As we did not wish to be an expense to her, our cook prepared our servants' meals, and also our own when my aunt dined out or had company for dinner. My maid Marguerite, who had never left me, refused all the offers and even prayers of my grandmother in order to accompany me. The summer of 1788 we passed at Passy, in a house which Madame Denis had leased, together with Madame de Poix, de Bouillon and de Biron. My aunt and I lived there all the time, while these ladies came there in turn. Monsieur de la Tour du Pin had been appointed colonel of the regiment of Royal Vaisseau. This body of troops was in a state of great indiscipline, not by the conduct of the soldiers and the under officers, which was excellent, but by the attitude of the officers, who had been spoiled by their former colonel, Monsieur de Saint, husband of the Queen's Dame d'Atour. When my husband, who was very severe in the matter of discipline, arrived at his regiment, he found that these gentlemen were not attending to their duties. Having ascertained that during the daily drills the regiment was commanded by the under-officers and the lieutenant-colonel, Monsieur de Kegaradec, Monsieur de la Tour du Pain declared that, as he expected to be present at the drills every morning at sunrise, he should require that the officers also be present. This order raised a perfect storm of discontent, and punishments, arrests, prison. No measures could determine the officers to fulfil their duties. In this way, the summer passed. In the autumn, a camp for manoeuvres was to be formed at Saint-Omer under the command of the Prince de Condé. The first manoeuvre, which should have been executed in a model manner, was very unsatisfactory, and Monsieur de la Tour du Pain was furious. He reported to the prince regarding the bad spirit of the regiment, or rather, that of the officers. The prince declared that if at the next manoeuvre the officers did not do better, he would put them all under arrest for the duration of the camp, and that the companies would be commanded by the under-officers. This order had the desired effect, and there was no further insubordination. While these events were happening at Saint-Omer, I was living very pleasantly at Passy with my aunt and one or two of her friends. I often visited Paris, and also passed some time at Berny with Madame de Montesson, who was always full of kindness for me. Here I met very frequently old Prince Henry of Prussia, brother of the great Frederick. He was a man of much capacity, both military and literary, and a great admirer of all the philosophers whom his brother had attracted to his court, and particularly of Voltaire. He knew our literature better than any Frenchman. As I am not writing a history of the Revolution, I shall not speak of all the conversations, arguments and disputes that the difference of opinions occasioned in society. For my eighteen years these discourses were very boring, and I endeavoured to divert myself by visiting as often as possible a charming house where I was attached by ties of friendship since the period of my youth and especially from the day that I had been obliged to leave my relatives. The Hôtel de Rochois was one of those patriarchal mansions which will never be seen again, and where several generations mingled, sans gêne, sans ennui, sans exigence. Madame de Courtay, a very rich widow, had married her only daughter to the Comte de Rochois. She lived with her son-in-law and their two daughters, in a large and beautiful mansion in the Rue de Grenelle. Madame de Rochois had been an intimate friend of my mother's, and I had passed my childhood with her two daughters, who were from two to four years older than myself. The elder had married, at the age of fifteen, the Duc de Pienne, since Duc de Mont. She was an amiable girl with an agreeable face, without being precisely pretty. 
her husband according to the usage in high society at that time was the avowed and declared lover of madame de Rueil, which made his wife very unhappy i was more intimate however with rosalie the younger sister she had been married at the age of twelve years and one day with the grandson of the marechal de richelieu the comte de chinon who was then only fifteen years of age at this time she was still a nice little girl but thin and very delicate while he was a disagreeable boy whom in our children's parties we could not endure this marriage was celebrated before the death of my mother and i was present immediately after the dinner which was given at the hotel de richelieu the bridegroom set out with his tutor for a european tour leaving thus at the beginning of the year seventeen eighty two he did not return to france until about seven years later he had then become a large and fine young man and an excellent fellow at the hotel de rochechois every one was delighted at his return except his poor wife who was far from participating in this joy in completing her growth she had become at the age of fourteen a complete hunchback and she was afraid that her husband would detest her on account of this deformity to add to the misfortunes of this poor man he found upon his return two sisters born of a second marriage of his father who were deformed in the same manner as his wife these three hunchbacks gave him a feeling of horror for his native country at the first indications of the coming revolution he emigrated and went to russia where he gained much glory in the war between the russians and the turks during the course of which he served as a volunteer in the army of catherine the second with messieurs de dama and de langeron returning to france under the consulate he left almost immediately for russia whence he did not return until after the restoration i think that it was during the spring of the year seventeen eighty nine that the duke of dorset the english ambassador who had just been replaced by lord gower and his charming wife lady sutherland gave a fine ball on the eve of his leaving paris at the bottom of the invitations he had placed very cavalierly les dames seront en blanc this order displeased me by way of protest i ordered a charming robe of blue crepe trimmed with flowers of the same colour my gloves and my fan were also adorned with blue ribbons in my coiffure arranged by leonard were blue feathers this piece of childish folly had a great success everybody kept remarking was a bleu couleur du temps the duke of dorset himself was amused at this pleasantry and said that the irish were pig-headed in the midst of our pleasures we approached the month of may seventeen eighty nine now that a long life permits me to pass and review the events which i saw unroll before me i am confounded by the profound blindness of the unfortunate king and of his ministers everyone insisted upon the necessity of modelling the new constitution of france upon that of england which few persons understood m de lally afterwards the marquis de lally tollendal in spite of his pretensions fully to understand the english constitution was himself ignorant of its details although he passed for an oracle the force of his speech filled with delight the ladies who listened to him he had turned the head of my aunt who had no doubt of his success in the states-general m de lally had just been elected deputy to the assembly by the nobility of paris i was present at one of the first meetings of this assembly with twenty or thirty ladies i was concealed behind the curtains of the tribunes which had been arranged in the windows of the hall the first two names taken from the election urn of persons nominated for secretaries of the assembly were those of m de lally and m despremeny the president of the parliament of paris now it so happened that m despremeny was the person who had made the report 
upon the sad affair which had sent General de Lally to the scaffold in 1766. Before the different courts where Monsieur de Lally, his son, had pleaded for the rehabilitation of the memory of his father, Monsieur d'Espremeny had pleaded on the other side, and in such a furious manner that a profound hatred had arisen between the two men. Therefore, when these two were proclaimed as the secretaries of the assembly, and they left their places at the end of the hall to seat themselves side by side at the desk, there was heard a murmur of very marked interest in favour of Monsieur de Lally. When a few moments later he addressed a few brief words to the assembly to thank them for his nomination, and stated that all private misunderstandings should disappear before the public interest, everyone present enthusiastically applauded him. At the beginning of the spring of 1789, which followed a terrible winter that had been very hard upon the poor, the Duc de Léon Égalité was very popular in Paris. He had sold the previous year a large part of the pictures of the splendid gallery of his palace, and it was generally stated that the eight million francs received from this sale had been devoted to relieving the misery of the people during the rigorous winter which had just ended. On the other hand, nothing was said, rightly or wrongly, of the charities of the princes of the royal family and of the king and queen. This unfortunate princess had become entirely devoted to the Polignac family. She no longer went to the theatre in Paris, and no one ever saw her or her children. The king also never appeared in public, shut up at Versailles or hunting in the surrounding woods. He suspected nothing, foresaw nothing, believed nothing. The queen detested the Duc d'Orléans, who had spoken harshly of her. He had wished to marry his son, the Duc de Chartres, afterwards King Louis-Philippe, with Madame Royale, the daughter of the king. But the Comte d'Artois, afterwards Charles X, also desired the hand of this princess for his son, the Duc d'Angoulême, a match which the Queen preferred. The demand of the Duc d'Orléans was therefore refused, and he was mortally offended. His visits to Versailles were very infrequent, and I do not recall ever having met him in the Queen's room at the hour that the princes came there just before Mass, as he was never in his apartment at Versailles, I had not been officially presented to him. This, however, did not prevent me from being present at the suppers which he gave at the Palais Royal, which during this winter were very brilliant. I was present at the supper he gave at which was employed for the first time the beautiful silver service which he had ordered of Arthur, the great jeweller of the epoch. If I am correct in my recollection, the service appeared to me too light and too English. But this was the fashion. It was necessary that everything should be English, from our constitution to our horses and our carriages. I was often envied, because in public places I had the good fortune to evoke the exclamation, Voilà, une Anglaise! Since I have spoken of Monsieur de Lally at the moment when he became a marked man, it is well to tell the story of his origin, as well as the remarkable history of that illegitimacy from father to son, which has perhaps never been encountered in any other family. Gerard Lally, the great-grandfather of the Lally of whom I am speaking, was a poor little Irish gentleman who had taken the side of James the Second. I think that he came originally from the estate of my ancestor, Lord Dillon. The daughter of my great-great-uncle, Lord Dillon, had been seduced by this Sherard Lally, who was probably handsome and attractive. A son was born of their relations, and Lord Dillon demanded that Gerard should wed his daughter and legitimise the child. First case of bastardy. The natural son of Gérard Lally distinguished himself during the troubles and wars of James the Second, who made him a baronet, and permitted him to recruit troops on the estates of his ancestors. He accompanied James the Second to France, and died, if I am not mistaken, at Saint-Germain. Although he was never married, 
nevertheless he also left a natural son by a lady of normandy whose name i have never known second case of bastardy the natural son of sir gerard lally became the general lally who was condemned to death and executed in seventeen sixty six and whose name was rehabilitated in seventeen eighty one at seventeen years of age he entered the army and distinguished himself in all the wars of louis the fifteenth he accompanied prince charles edward in the glorious campaign of seventeen forty five which ended in the unfortunate defeat at culloden in seventeen forty six it is said that on his return to france he became very much enamoured of my grandmother but this is certain that he formed a very tender friendship for mademoiselle mary dillon eldest sister of my great-uncle the archbishop of narbonne mademoiselle mary dillon was never married and died in seventeen eighty six at chandemain en laye at a very advanced age she was on bad terms for a long time with her brother the archbishop this misunderstanding caused originally by some family disagreement was perpetuated by the troublesome interference of my grandmother madame de Hort, who feared the influence on the archbishop of madame dillon whom she detested it so happened that i never saw mademoiselle dillon until the year before her death she had then become reconciled with my uncle and we frequently went to see her at saint germain but to return to lally and the third case of bastardy to which the family seemed to be condemned before general de lally was sent to india as governor of the french possessions he had had an intrigue amoureuse with a comtesse de molde nee saluce wife of a flemish lord of the environs of arras or of saint omer and aunt of the saluce whom we knew at bordeaux as a result of this liaison he had a son whom he caused to be brought up under another name at the jesuit college of paris a dramatic event was destined to have a dominant influence upon the future of this child as i have already said mademoiselle mary dillon who was a great friend of general de lally was his confidant in the matter of the intrigue with the comtesse de molde and looked after this child who was ignorant of his origin and of the name of his father after the execution of general de lally an irish officer named drumgold was entrusted by mademoiselle dillon with the details of the allowance of this young boy and went to see him drumgold no sooner found himself alone with the child than this lad of twelve years began to speak to him of the execution of monsieur de lally which had taken place the previous day he approved of the sentence and to justify it repeated all the arguments which he had heard at the jesuit college drumgold unable to remain silent upon hearing such language from the mouth of the son of the person who had just been executed cried malheureux il était ton père at these words young lally fainted and remained unconscious several hours a severe illness followed and it was during his convalescence that he formed the resolution to consecrate his life to the rehabilitation of the memory of his father from this moment all his readings all his studies all his thoughts tended to this end general de lally had recognized his son in his will the boy took his name and at eighteen years of age he commenced the work of rehabilitating his father by composing pleadings and memoirs which were models of close reasoning and eloquence during a period of twenty years this was his sole occupation and his only thought having received very little money from the inheritance of his father he lived with mademoiselle dillon at saint germain en laye and was protected by marechal de noailles and by marechal de beauvau both friends of mademoiselle dillon when in seventeen eighty five my great-uncle became reconciled with his sister we saw at her apartment at saint germain monsieur lally whom i had not previously known he was then about thirty-five years of age and had a very handsome face but an effeminate air which did not please me 
after having pleaded before three parliaments he had succeeded in gaining his cause and had acquired a great reputation for eloquence and a well-merited standing from the constancy with which he had carried his case to success it would be only just to attribute a great part of the honour of his conduct to mademoiselle dillon a person of distinguished spirit of very superior character she had gained an absolute empire over monsieur de lally and in the solitude in which he lived at saint germain she was entirely devoted to his interests she died in seventeen eighty six leaving him by her will all the property of which she was able to dispose more than this she had arranged that he should have the reversion of the apartment which she occupied at saint germain and which was the one given by louis the fourteenth to her father when he arrived at the chateau with james the second she had been born there as well as her four sisters and five brothers of whom the youngest was the archbishop of narbonne my father deeply regretted when he returned from the islands that she had disposed of this lodging the cradle of the family in france Monsieur de Lally would have shown more delicacy in not accepting among the objects which were left him many of the family souvenirs, which were without value to him, but which my father and I highly esteemed on account of their origin. End of Part 1 Chapter 8《Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1789. Fall of the Bastille The winter of 1789, which was cold and disastrous for the people, in society was as brilliant as usual with spectacles and balls during this time circumstances led me to make a very curious acquaintance madame de genlis was gouverneur of the young orleans princes and of their sister louise this unusual title of gouverneur was one which the duc d'orleans had wished to give her on his demanding permission of the king louis the sixteenth the latter replied shrugging his shoulders and turning on his heel Gouverneur ou gouvernante, vous êtes le maître de faire ce que vous plaira. D'ailleurs, le comte à trois a des enfants. Madame de Genlis lived in a pavilion of the convent of Bellechasse, which was situated at the end of the rue de Bellechasse in the rue Saint Dominique. This pavilion, which was very small, was composed of a rez de chaussee which you entered immediately from the street after having mounted several steps covered by an oval under which carriages could penetrate if the coachman was not too maladroit a vestibule where the servants remained served as an antechamber madame de genlis occupied this small pavilion with mademoiselle d'orleon who was then thirteen years of age she had with her pamela afterwards lady fitzgerald of whom i shall speak later on and Henriette de Cercy, both of whom were being brought up with the princess. The princes themselves did not sleep in the pavilion. They were brought there at an early hour of the morning, and returned in the evening after supper with their sous-gouverneur to sleep at the Palais Royal. As I had often met them, and as I was very friendly with Madame de Valence, the daughter of Madame de Genlis, madame de montesson invited me to come to see her when the young princes were there madame de genlis had taken a great fancy to me and wished to have me present at the little soirée dansante which she gave once a week during this winter the dances always finished before eleven o'clock and were not followed by a supper the duc de chartres afterwards king louis philippe had commenced to go out in society that is to say he was sometimes present at the suppers at the palais royal he had entered the army and had the cordon bleu he was a fat boy very awkward and uncouth with pale and hanging cheeks an air at once sly serious and timid 
he was said to be well informed and even learned it would be unjust to assert nevertheless that madame de genlis system of education had not its good side especially when you compared it with the one adopted for his two pupils by the duc de serran gouverneur of the children of the comte d'artois no one ever saw them and they remained as great strangers to france as if they were to reign in china the orleans princes on the other hand devoted their promenades and their recreations to everything which could instruct them they learned at the same time as they were amused this rendered them popular and events have shown that the one of the three who survived profited by his experience since i have mentioned the name of pamela let us speak a moment of her origin madame de genlis let people understand that she had found the child in england but everybody thought that she was the daughter of herself and the duc d'orleans égalité strangely enough however i have reason to believe that the assertion of madame de genlis was the truth my aunt lady jerningham had known intimately in shropshire where her husband had a large estate a clergyman who was also acquainted with madame de genlis this clergyman stated that he had received a letter from madame de genlis asking him to find for her a young girl whom she wished to adopt the curate said that he had found such a child and that he had sent her to a place in london which had been indicated to him and lady jerningham had no doubt but that this child was pamela at the age of fifteen when i knew her you could not imagine anything more delicate than her face which had not a defect nor even an imperfection she was as beautiful as a young goddess all of her movements were graceful her smile was angelic her teeth like pearls in seventeen ninety two at the age of eighteen she turned the head of lord edward fitzgerald fifth son of the duke of leinster who married her and took her to ireland where he was the head of the insurgents united irishmen on the death of her husband she returned to the continent and established herself at hamburg where she married the american consul mr pitcairn i shall speak of her later on in the spring of seventeen eighty nine after the winter which had been so cruel for the poor and after the opening of the states-general never had people shown themselves more disposed to amusement without being embarrassed in any way by the public misery there were races at vincennes where the horses of the duc d'orleans ran against those of the comte d'artois it was when returning from the last of these races with madame de valence in her carriage that in passing through the rue saint antoine we came upon the first of the public assemblies of this epoch the elections being terminated every one made arrangements to establish himself at versailles all the members of the states-general searched for apartments in the city those who were attached to the court arranged to occupy the apartments reserved for them in the chateau my aunt had her lodging there and i lived with her her quarters were located very high over the gallery of the princes and was situated in the wing of the chateau fronting on the parterre du midi and the terrasse de l'orangerie the room which i occupied looked out on the roofs while that of my aunt faced the terrace and had a very fine view we occupied these lodgings saturday nights only Monsieur de Bois, as governor of Versailles, had at his disposal a charming little house with a pretty garden at the Menagerie, which was a small isolated chateau situated in the Grand Parc, at the extremity of one of the arms of the canal opposite the Trianon. He loaned this to my aunt, and here we settled, with our servants, her horses and mine, that is to say, my saddle horses and my English groom this lodging was very agreeable all our acquaintances were established at versailles and we attended with pleasure and without anxiety the opening of this assembly which was to regenerate france when i reflect now upon this blindness 
i can only conceive it as possible for young people like myself as for men of affairs and the ministers the thing seems inexplicable my husband was so put out because he was not elected deputy to the states-general that he did not wish to be present at the opening of the session the spectacle was magnificent but as it has been so often described in the memoirs of the time i shall not speak of it the king wore the costume of the cordon bleu and all the princes the same with the difference only that the king's costume was more richly ornamented and covered with diamonds this good prince had no dignity of carriage he held himself badly and waddled his movements were brusque and ungraceful and his short-sightedness inasmuch as it was not customary then to wear glasses caused him to squint his speech though very short was given in a resolute tone the queen was remarkable for her great dignity but you could see by the almost convulsive movements of her fan that she was very much moved the address of monsieur necker minister of finance bored me to death it lasted more than two hours and to my nineteen years seemed eternal the first of june my husband and the other colonels rejoined their regiments he was in garrison at valenciennes and consequently was not connected with the troops which had been assembled at the gates of paris under the command of marechal de brogny owing to the fatal feebleness which was always shown at the moment when firmness was necessary the government did not employ these troops at the opportune moment the queen showed only discontent without ever deciding to act meanwhile there was no material change in the system of etiquette which enveloped the court every day i wrote my husband the news which i had gathered these letters which would have been a great assistance to me in writing these souvenirs i did not preserve the first event which seemed to me serious was the withdrawal of monsieur necker from the ministry it was the extraordinary conditions of his departure rather than the consequences which struck me i had made a visit to the contrôle general the eve of the day that we were to set out my aunt and i to visit the marechal de beauvau at his country house of leval at the end of the terrace of saint germain while we were taking luncheon in the pavilion in the garden a valet de chambre arrived very much troubled and inquired of the marechal if he knew where monsieur necker was he added that the evening before on returning from the council the minister had gotten into a carriage with madame necker saying that he was going to take supper at laval and that since then he had not been seen and no one knew where to find him this disappearance very much disturbed us and my aunt wished to return to versailles or rather to the menagerie where we were established on arriving there the mystery was unveiled the horses of monsieur necker had returned to versailles having conducted their master to bouger from this place he had taken the post to go to switzerland by way of the low countries his intention in so leaving the ministry was to avoid testimonials of his popularity which his departure could not have failed to evoke madame de montesson who was at paris had formed the plan of going to berny to pass the summer loving the world as she did she would doubtless have preferred to establish herself for the season at versailles which was then the centre of society and affairs but her position with regard to the court did not permit this berny was not very far from versailles and she could go there in two hours by the sceau road she therefore decided to establish herself there with madame de valence and invited me to come and pass a month or six weeks the thirteenth of july therefore i sent off my saddle horses with my english groom who hardly spoke french and ordered him to go by way of paris in order to secure certain articles which were necessary i relate 
this little incident as proof that no one had the least idea of what was to happen in paris the following day the little army which was assembled in the plain of grenelle and the champ de mars reassured the court and although there were desertions every day no one was disturbed when you remember that my personal position put me in way of knowing everything that m de lally an influential member of the assembly lived with my aunt and myself at the little house of the menagerie that i went every day to supper at versailles with madame de poix whose husband was captain of the guards and a member of the assembly and saw the king every evening you will be very much surprised at what i am going to relate our security was so profound that the fourteenth of july at noon we had no idea my aunt and myself that there was the slightest tumult at paris and i got into my carriage with a maid and a domestic on the box to go to berny by the highway to sceaux which traverses the bois de verrieres it is true that this route that of versailles to choisy le roi does not pass through any villages and is very solitary i recall that i had dined at an early hour at versailles so as to arrive at berny in my apartment before supper which in the country was served at nine o'clock on arriving at berny i was surprised after having entered the first court to see no one and to find the stables deserted the doors closed and the same solitude in the court of the chateau the concierge who knew me well on hearing the carriage came out on the step and cried with a troubled air eh mon dieu madame madame n'est pas ici personne n'est sorti de paris on a tiré le canon de la pastille il y a eu un massacre quitter la ville est impossible les portes sont barricadées et gardées par les gardes françaises qui se sont révoltées avec le peuple you can conceive of my astonishment greater even than my anxiety but as unforeseen circumstances in spite of my youth did not greatly disconcert me i ordered the carriage to turn around and conduct me to the post of chevaux of berny where i knew the master to be a worthy man very devoted to madame de montesson and her friends i told him of my desire to return immediately to versailles he confirmed to me the story of the concierge my hired coachman however declared that he would not return to versailles for anything in the world i then arranged to have hitched up four post horses with two postilions for whom the master vouched as determined fellows and we set out at a full gallop to return to versailles i arrived there at eleven o'clock my aunt who had a headache was already in bed she had not seen madame de poix and m de lally had not returned she therefore knew nothing on seeing me at her bedside she thought she had had a bad dream or that my head was turned as for myself i confess that the fate of my english groom and my three horses worried me more than anything else the next morning at an early hour we were at the chateau my aunt went to look for news while i hastened to my father-in-law from whom i learned everything that had passed the taking of the bastille the revolt of the regiment of the french guards the deaths of mrs de launay and of flesselle and of many others who were more obscure the useless charge upon the place louis cannes of the squadron royal allemand commanded by the prince de lambesque the following day a deputation of the people forced m de lafayette to place himself at the head of the national guard which had been instituted seven or eight days after the fourteenth of july m de la tour du pin arrived en secre at versailles from his garrison as he was much disturbed regarding his father and myself the ministry of war did not disapprove of this slight infraction and a leave of absence was given him at the request of his father who was glad to have his son beside him nevertheless after the visit of the king to paris which had been required by the commune and the return of m necker who had been brought back in the hope of calming the excitement 
my husband who did not think that his father should accept the position of minister of war which had been offered him wished to leave versailles in order not to influence his father in his determination i had been ordered to go to the springs of forge in normandy and the month which we spent there is one of the periods of my life which i recall with the greatest pleasure having sent our saddle horses we made long promenades every day in the beautiful woods and pretty country which surround this little city we had brought with us a great variety of books and my husband an indefatigable reader read them to me while i occupied myself with embroidery and other handiwork End of part one chapter nine Part one chapter ten of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire This is a Librivox recording for well, Librivox recordings are in the public domain seventeen eighty nine Versailles invaded by the mob Several days after the events which I have just recounted my husband received a courier announcing the nomination of his father as minister of war we immediately set out for versailles this was the commencement of my public life my father-in-law took up his quarters in the war department which was installed in that part of the palace forming the southern wing of the cour des ministres he put me at the head of his mansion to do the honours together with my sister-in-law who was also lodged at the ministry but who at the end of two months was obliged to leave us with my husband i occupied a fine apartment on the first floor i had become so accustomed at montpellier and paris to state dinners that my new situation did not in any way embarrass me there were two dinners a week of twenty-four covers to which were invited all the members of the assembly in turn their wives were never invited madame de lamette and i were seated facing each other and we had beside us the four individuals of the most importance chosen always from the different parties inasmuch as we were at versailles the men without exception were always in full dress at these dinners and i remember monsieur de robespierre in an apple green costume with a mass of white hair which was well dressed Mirabeau was the only one who did not come, and was never invited. I often went out to supper, sometimes to the houses of our colleagues, and sometimes to those of persons established at Versailles during the period of the National Assembly. Two days after the taking of the Bastille, the 14th of July, the Comte d'Artois, with his children, left France, and went to turin to his father-in-law the king of sardinia several persons of his household accompanied him among others monsieur denin the captain of his guards the queen thinking that the popular feeling might compromise the security of the polignac family arranged for them also to leave france madame de polignac took with her her daughter the duchesse de Gramont, and I saw her for the last time on the eve of her departure. Everything in France follows the custom, and that of immigration commenced at this time. All began to raise money upon their property in order to carry away a large sum. Nobody at that time foresaw the consequences that would follow this action. Nevertheless, the motion adopted the night of the 4th of August, which destroyed feudal rights should have proved to the most incredulous that the national assembly would not stop at this beginning of robbery my father-in-law was ruined and we have never recovered from this blow to our fortune entire spoliation was not decreed at this time they only settled the rate at which property could be reacquired but before the expiration of the date fixed for the payment of this sum it was decided that such payment could not be made in fine everything was lost by a stroke of the pen we were ruined since then we have been obliged to live by expedients from the proceeds of the sale of what remained to us 
At this time I did not realise that my grandmother, who during the past six months had retired to Hautefontaine with my uncle the Archbishop, was also to entirely deprive me of my fortune, upon which I had every reason to count. I could not foresee that my uncle, who still enjoyed an income of over 400,000 francs, of which he could not spend one-fourth part in the retreat where he lived, would leave, when he departed from France the following year, nearly two million francs of debts, in which my grandmother was compromised. We did not at once realise all the consequences of the ruin which had come to us. My father-in-law as minister received a salary of 300,000 francs, besides his income as lieutenant-general and commander of a province. However, he was obliged to keep up an expensive establishment, and besides the two state dinners a week of twenty-four covers, we gave two elegant suppers, to which I invited twenty-five or thirty ladies. Madame Necker, the wife of the contrôle général, or, to speak more correctly, of the Prime Minister, lived on a footing similar to our own. But as she rarely went out, she received every day at supper the deputies and the savants, together with the admirers of her daughter, who was then in the full flush of her youth, interested at the same time in politics, science, intrigue, and love. Madame de Stahl lived with her father at the ministerial residence at Versailles, and it was at this period that she was most involved with Alexandre de la Mette, who at the time was still the friend of my husband. This friendship, which dated from their youth, disturbed me. I had a very poor opinion of the morality of this young man, and my sister-in-law shared my feeling in this respect. Therefore, when several months later my husband completely broke with him and his brother Charles, we were delighted. Although I was on a footing of intimate relations with Madame de Stahl, these never went so far as confidence in her. This woman was a strange mixture of good and bad qualities of which I have often endeavoured to explain the connection. Her good qualities were tarnished by the passions to which she easily gave way. Nevertheless, it would be wrong to think that I considered her as really a licentious person. In spite of everything, she always exacted a certain delicacy of sentiment, and she was susceptible to passions which were very strong and very ardent, as long as they lasted. Thus it was that she passionately loved Monsieur de Narbonne, who abandoned her in a very unworthy manner. At this time, the National Guard was being organised throughout the kingdom on the model of that of Paris, of which Monsieur Lafayette was generalissimo. The king himself desired that that of Versailles should be formed, and that all the clerks and employés of the ministry should become members. In the Comte d'Estaing, a bad choice was made for the commander. My father had served under his orders at the beginning of the American War, and had the most positive proofs that the Comte was lacking not only in ability, but in courage. However, on his return, he was loaded with praise, whereas my father, to whom he owed his first success, as it was the Dillon Regiment which took Grenade, received after the war only neglect. It was due to the request of the Queen that Monsieur d'Estaing was named as Commander-in-Chief of the National Guard of Versailles. My father-in-law appointed his son as second-in-command, which was equivalent to the real command, as Monsieur d'Estaing never occupied himself with his duties, except when he was unable to avoid it. Monsieur Bertier, who was later Prince de Wagram, a very distinguished officer of the general staff, was named as Major General. He was a worthy man who had talent as organiser, but the feebleness of his character left him open to all kinds of intrigues. The day of St. Louis, it was customary for the magistrates and officers of the city of Paris to bring their felicitations to the king. This year the National Guard wished also to take part in this function, and the Generalissimo, Monsieur Lafayette, 
went to versailles with his staff at the same time as monsieur bay the mayor of paris and all the municipal officers the fish women also came as usual to bring a bouquet to the king the queen received them all ceremoniously in the salon vert adjoining her bedchamber the ordinary etiquette of these receptions was followed the queen as usual wore a dress which was very much trimmed and covered with diamonds she was seated in a large fauteuil with a kind of small stool at her feet at right and left seated upon stools were several duchesses in full dress and behind them all the ladies and gentlemen of the household the usher announced la vie de paris the queen expected that the mayor would kneel as he had done in previous years but monsieur bay on entering only made a deep bow to which the queen responded by a nod of the head which was not very cordial he delivered a short address very well written in which he spoke of devotion of attachment and also a little of the fear of the people regarding the shortage of food with which they were menaced every day then monsieur de lafayette advanced and presented the staff of the national guard the queen turned red and i saw that her emotion was very great she stammered several words in a trembling voice and then dismissed them with a nod of the head they went away very much displeased with her as i have since learned this unfortunate princess never considered the importance of the circumstances in which she found herself she was influenced by the feelings of the moment without considering the consequences these officers of the national guard whom a gracious word would have won went away in bad humour and spread their discontent throughout paris all this increased the ill feeling which they had towards the queen and of which the duc d'orleans was the first author the national guard of versailles like the other troops of the kingdom wished to have flags and it was decided that these should be solemnly consecrated at notre dame de versailles a deputation of the principal officers with monsieur d'estaing at the head came to request me to interest myself in the ceremony of this benediction if any one had told me at the time that the modest major of the national guard bertier whose father was steward of the war department would become the sovereign prince of neufchatel and that he would wed a german princess i should have laughed at such a tale but we have seen others even more remarkable i was present at this very brilliant and very solemn ceremony where there were deputations from all the military corps present at versailles during this high mass which was very long i had time to reflect upon the march of events hardly fourteen months before i had been present the day of pentecost in the chapel of versailles at a meeting of the chapter of the cordon bleu at which were present the king and all the princes of the royal house of whom several had already left france the regiment of flandre infanterie of which the marquis of lusignan a deputy was colonel had been ordered to versailles at this time the garde du corps wished to offer a dinner to the officers of this regiment of flanders and to those of the national guard they requested that for this purpose they should be allowed to use the large salle des spectacles de la cour at the end of the gallery of the chapel this superb hall could be converted into a ballroom by placing over the parterre a floor on a level with the boxes and the permission was given them the dinner commenced rather late and the theatre was brilliantly illuminated which would have been necessary under any circumstances as there were no windows my sister-in-law and i went towards the end of the dinner to view the scene which was really magnificent toasts were being proposed and my husband who came to meet us and to conduct us to one of the first tier boxes had time to tell us very low that the officers were very much excited and that inconsiderate words had been uttered all at once 
it was announced that the king and queen were coming to the banquet a very imprudent step which had the worst possible after-effect the sovereigns appeared in a box with the little dauphin who was about five years of age there were enthusiastic cries of vive le roi a swiss officer approached the box and asked the queen to confide to him the dauphin in order to make the round of the hall she consented and the poor little fellow was not at all afraid the officer put the child on the table and he made the round very boldly smiling and not at all frightened by the cries which he heard around him the queen was not so calm and when the child was brought back to her she embraced him tenderly we left as soon as the king and queen had retired the next day the opposition journals of which several were already in existence did not fail to give a description of the quote, orgy at versailles the fourth of october there was a shortage of bread at several bakers in paris and a great deal of tumult one of these bakers was hung in spite of the efforts of monsieur de lafayette and the national guard nevertheless at versailles no one was alarmed they thought that this revolt was similar to those which had already taken place and that the national guard of whose loyalty they felt sure would be able to control the people several messages which came to the king and to the president of the chambers were so reassuring that the fifth of october at ten o'clock in the morning the king set out for the hunt in the wood of verrieres while i myself after dejeuner went to rejoin madame de valence who had come to versailles we went for a drive in the garden of madame elizabeth at the end of the grande avenue as we descended from the carriage to traverse the contre we saw a man on horseback pass near us at full gallop it was the duc de maillet who cried out to us paris is marching here with cannon this news greatly frightened us and we returned at once to versailles where the alarm had been given my husband had gone to the assembly without knowing anything we were not in ignorance of the fact that there was a great deal of tumult in paris but we were not able to learn anything more because the gates had been closed and no one was permitted to go out monsieur de la tour du pin in searching in the corridors for a person with whom he wished to speak passed behind a large man whom he did not at once recognize who was saying paris is marching here with twelve pieces of cannon this personage was mirabeau then strongly allied with the duc d'orleans my husband hastened to his father who was already in conference with the other ministers the first thing that they did was to send in every direction where they thought the hunt might have led the king to warn him to return my husband occupied himself in assembling the national guard on whom he was far from having confidence he ordered the flanders regiment to take their arms and to occupy the place d'armes the garde du corps saddled their horses couriers were sent out to call the swiss from Courbevoie. messengers were sent out at every moment on the highway to obtain news of what was going on it was learned that an innumerable mob of men with many women were marching upon versailles that after this kind of advance guard came the national guard of paris with their cannon followed by a large troop of individuals marching without order there was no longer time to defend the bridge of sevres the national guard of that city had already given it up to the women and had fraternized with the guard of paris my father-in-law wished to send the flanders regiment to cut off the road from paris but the national assembly had declared itself in permanent session the king was absent and there was no one present to take the initiative in any hostile demonstration during this time the drums beat the call to assemble the national guard they came together on the place d'armes and were placed in battle order with their backs to the railing of the cour royale the flanders regiment had its left wing on the grande écurie and its right on the railing the post of the interior of the cour royale and that of the chapel were occupied by the swiss 
of whom there was always a strong detachment at versailles the gates everywhere were closed all the outlets of the chateau were barricaded and the doors which had not turned on their hinges since the days of louis the fourteenth were closed for the first time finally at about three o'clock the king and his suite arrived at full gallop by the grande avenue this unfortunate prince instead of stopping and addressing a kind word to this fine flanders regiment before which he passed and which cried vive le roi did not say a single word to them he went to shut himself up in his apartment from which he did not come out the national guard of versailles which was making its first campaign commenced to murmur and to declare that it would not fire upon the people of paris there were no cannon at versailles the advance guard of two or three hundred women commenced to arrive and to spread out in the avenue many entered the assembly and said that they had come to look for bread and to take the deputies to paris night came on and several gunshots were heard they came from the ranks of the national guard and were directed against my husband their commander whom they had refused to obey by remaining at their post my husband escaped by a miracle and realising the fact that his troop had abandoned him he went to take a place in front of the garde du corps who were drawn up in battle order near the petite ecurie but these troops which comprised only the company of grammont were so few in number that any idea of defence was thought impossible at this moment my father-in-law and monsieur de saint priest offered the advice that the king should retire to rambouillet with his family and await there any propositions which might be made to him by the insurgents of paris and by the national assembly the king at first accepted this plan at about eight or nine o'clock a company of the garde du corps was ordered to the cour royale which they entered by the gate of the rue de la surintendance now the rue gambetta from here they passed by the terrasse de l'orangerie under the windows of the apartments of queen marie antoinette traversed the little park and gained by the menagerie the grande route de saint cyr there was left of this troop at versailles only sufficient men to relieve the posts in the apartments of the king and queen the swiss and the sans suisse guarded their own posts it was at this moment that two or three hundred women who for an hour had been hovering around the gates discovered a little door opening upon the rue de rang commun which is a prolongation of the rue de la chancellerie this door gave access to a secret staircase which ended under that part of the building where we had our quarters in the cour des ministres some traitor had probably shown them this entrance they entered in a crowd knocking down the swiss guard posted at the top of the stairway then spread through the court and gained the quarters of the four ministers which were located in this part of the building my husband returned at this moment to bring news to his sister and myself very much disturbed to find us in such bad company he accompanied us into the chateau my sister-in-law had taken the precaution of sending her children to the house of a deputy one of our friends who was lodged in the city guided by monsieur de la tour du pin we ascended to the gallery where we found already gathered a number of persons living in the chateau who had come from their apartments to be nearer the source of news end of part one chapter ten a part one chapter ten b of recollections of the revolution and the empire this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. During this time, the King, still hesitating as to what decision to make, was no longer willing to depart for Rambouillet. He consulted everybody. The Queen, equally undecided, could not make up her mind to this flight by night my father-in-law went down on his knees to the king to implore him to put himself and his family in a place of security the ministers would have remained to treat with the insurgents and the assembly 
but the king repeating continually i do not wish to compromise any one thus lost a precious period of time at one time it was thought that he was going to yield and the order was given to prepare the carriages for departure for two hours they had been ready waiting in the grande d'écurie no one seemed to think that the people of versailles would oppose the departure of the royal family this however is what happened the moment that the crowd of people from paris and versailles who were assembled on the place d'armes saw the gate of the court of the grande écurie opened there was a unanimous cry of fear and fury le roi s'en va at the same moment they rushed upon the carriages cut the harness and led the horses back so that it was necessary to bring word to the chateau that the departure was impossible my father-in-law and monsieur de saint priest then offered our carriages which were hitched up outside the railing of the orangery but the king and the queen rejected this proposition and every one discouraged frightened and fearing the greatest misfortunes remained in silence and suspense in this gallery witness of all the splendours of the monarchy since louis the fourteenth every one walked up and down without exchanging a word the queen remained in her room with madame elizabeth the sister of louis the sixteenth and the wife of the comte de provence the salon de jeu hardly lighted was full of women who were talking in low tones some seated on stools and others upon the tables as for myself my agitation was so great that i could not remain for a moment in the same place every few minutes i went to the eau de boeuf from which one could see those who entered and who came out of the king's apartment in the hope of encountering my husband or my father-in-law and of learning from them some news the wait to me seemed intolerable finally at midnight my husband who had been in the court for some time came to announce that monsieur de lafayette had arrived before the gate of the cour des ministres with the national guard of paris and requested to speak with the king he added that a part of this guard composed of the former regiment de garde was manifesting much impatience and that the least delay might lead to trouble and even danger the king then said have monsieur de lafayette come up in an instant monsieur de la tour du pain was at the gate and monsieur de lafayette dismounting from his horse and so fatigued that he was hardly able to stand upright ascended to the king's apartment accompanied by seven or eight persons mostly from his staff very much moved he addressed the king in these terms sire je pensais qu'il valait mieux venir ici mourir au pied de votre majesté que de payer inutilement sur la place de grève to these words the king replied que veulent-ils donc lafayette said le peuple demande du pain et la garde désirait prendre ses anciens postes auprès de votre majesté the king said well let them do so these words were immediately reported to me my husband descended with monsieur de lafayette and the national guard of paris composed almost exclusively of the garde francaise resumed at once their former posts thus it happened that at every outer door where there had been a swiss guard a member of the guard of paris was posted and the rest made up of several hundred men were sent to bivouac as usual upon the place d'armes in a long building comprising several large halls constructed and painted in the form of tents during this time the people of paris had left the vicinity of the chateau and had dispersed in the city and the cabarets the women who had invaded the offices of the ministry were sleeping everywhere on the floor the principal leaders of the women had taken refuge in the hall of the national assembly where they remained during the night mingled with the deputies who were being relieved in order to keep up the permanent session i think that monsieur de lafayette after having established his posts of the national guard went to the assembly whence he returned to the chateau with madame de poix 
whose quarters were near the chapel in the gallery of that name as for monsieur d'estaing he had not appeared during the whole day and had remained in the cabinet of the king taking no more responsibility for the national guard of versailles than as if he had not been their commander-in-chief monsieur de la tour du pin had brought together a small number of the officers of his staff upon whom he thought he could count among whom was major berthier but the majority of the officers at this advanced hour had retired to their own quarters or to the houses of persons of their acquaintance the king to whom they had reported that the most absolute calm reigned at versailles which at that moment was really true dismissed all the persons who were still present in the eau de boeuf or in his cabinet the ushers came to the gallery to tell the ladies who were still there that the queen had retired the doors were closed the candles extinguished and my husband escorted us back to the apartment of my aunt which was situated above the gallery des princes at the top of the south wing of the chateau he did not wish to take us back to our rooms in the ministry on account of the women who were sleeping in the antechambers and who caused us great disgust after having placed us in security in this apartment he redescended to find his father and pray him to go to bed saying that he himself would watch during the night he went to his room to put on an overcoat over his uniform for the night was cold and damp then taking a round hat he descended to the court and proceeded to visit the posts he went through the courts the passages and the garden to assure himself that it was quiet everywhere he did not hear the least noise either around the chateau or in the adjacent streets the different posts were relieved with vigilance and the guard which was installed in the large tent upon the place d'armes and which had placed the cannon in the form of battery before the gate was performing its service with the same regularity as before the fourteenth of july such is the exact account of what passed at versailles the fifth of october monsieur de la tour du pin having heard nothing of a nature to lead him to fear the least disorder returned after his nocturnal round to the office of the minister of war in the south wing of the cour des ministres however instead of going to the cabinet or to his room which like my own faced the rue du grand commun he remained in the dining-room and placed himself at a window to have the air for fear of going to sleep it is well to explain here that the cour des princes was then closed by a gate near which was stationed a garde du corps for here was the first post of the guard of the king's person a service which particularly devolved upon the garde du corps and the saint suisse in the interior of this little court there was a passage which communicated with the corps royal this had been arranged so as to enable the garde du corps who was stationed in the corps royal at the corner of the corps marbre when the posts were changed to go out by the gate in the middle of the cour royale and re-enter by that of the cour des princes it will be seen in a moment how necessary the knowledge of this passageway was to the assassins day was commencing to break it was almost six o'clock and the most profound silence reigned in the court monsieur de la tour du pain leaning out of the window thought he heard the steps of a great crowd of people which seemed to ascend the rampe that led to the cour des ministres from the rue de la surintendance then to his great surprise he saw a mob of miserable creatures enter by the gate although it had been closed and locked the key had been obtained by an act of treason the crowd was armed with axes and sabres at the same moment my husband heard a gunshot during the time he took to descend the stairway and to have the door of the ministry opened the assassins had killed monsieur de valerie the garde du corps posted at the gate of the cour des princes and had rushed through the passage of which i have just spoken to fall upon the cour de garde de cour royale some of the crowd who were not more than two hundred in number rushed to the marble staircase 
while another part hurled themselves upon the garde du corps whom his comrades had abandoned without defence this unfortunate man after having fired one shot with which he killed the nearest of his assailants was immediately cut down by the others this task accomplished the invaders rushed to rejoin the other part of the band which at this moment had forced aside the guard of the saint suisse posted at the top of the marble staircase the proof that no extra precautions had been taken is found in the fact that the assassins arrived at the top of the staircase and certainly guided by someone who knew the route to follow turned into the queen's guardroom and fell suddenly upon the only guard who was posted in this place this guard rushed to the door of the queen's bedchamber which was closed on the inside and having rapped several times with the cross of his mousqueton he cried madame save yourself they are coming to kill you then resolved to sell his life dearly he placed his back against the door discharged his mousqueton and defended himself by his sabre but was quickly cut down by these miserable creatures who fortunately had no firearms he fell against the door and his body hindered the assassins from breaking it in his body was pushed aside into the embrasure of the window which saved his life during this time my sister-in-law and i were sleeping in one of the apartments of my aunt madame denin my fatigue was so great that my sister-in-law had considerable trouble in awakening me as neither of us was undressed we both rushed to the room of my aunt which looked out upon the park and where she was unable to hear anything her fright was equal to our own we immediately called our servants before they were awakened my good and devoted marguerite came running to us pale as death and tumbling upon the first chair she cried ah oh, mon dieu nous allons tous être massacrés this exclamation was far from reassuring us marguerite stated that she had left her room with the intention of coming to ascertain whether i had need of her services but in descending the staircase she had discovered a large number of very ordinary people and seen arriving a monsieur with boots covered with mud and a whip in his hand who was no other than the duc d'orleans whom she recognized perfectly as she had often seen him furthermore that these miserable creatures surrounded him and showed their joy at seeing him by crying vive notre roi d'orleans marguerite had hardly finished this moving recital when my husband arrived he told us that on seeing the assassins penetrate into the cour royale he had immediately rushed to the grand garde stationed upon the place d'armes to have the drums beat the alarm we also learned from him that the queen had been able to save herself by going to the king's apartment through a little passage arranged under the room known as the eau de boeuf which formed the means of communication between her bedroom and that of the king he persuaded us to leave my aunt's apartment which was too near in his opinion to those of the king and queen and counselled us to rejoin madame de simene who was lodged near the orangerie the abbe de damas came to find us and conduct us there at the end of two hours which seemed to me centuries my husband sent a valet de chambre to inform me that they were leading the king and queen to paris that the ministers the administration and the national assembly were quitting versailles where he himself had the order to remain to save the chateau from pillage after the departure of the king he added that for this purpose they were leaving him a swiss battalion the national guard of versailles of which the commander-in-chief m d'estaing had sent in his resignation and a battalion of the national guard of paris for the moment he forbade me absolutely to issue from my refuge i stayed alone for several hours as my aunt had gone to madame de poix who was also leaving for paris and my sister-in-law had left me to go in search of her children and her husband he had just arrived from enoncourt and wished to have her leave at once for the country i do not think that i ever in my life passed hours more cruel than those of this morning the death cries by which i had been awakened still resounded in my ears 
the least noise made me tremble my imagination conjured up all the dangers which my husband could run my maid marguerite who could have encouraged me was also absent she had returned to the ministry to assist my servants in packing our effects which were to go to paris by the wagons of my father-in-law about three o'clock madame denin returned to look for me and announced that the sad cortege had set out for paris the carriage of the king preceded by the heads of the garde du corps which their assassins were carrying on the ends of their pikes in getting into his carriage louis the sixteenth had said to monsieur de la tour du pin vous restez maître ici tachez de me sauver mon pauvre versailles this injunction was equivalent to an order which he was firmly resolved to obey he took measures to carry out this order with the commander of the battalion of the national guard of paris who had been left with him a man who was very determined and who showed the best good will this was santerre i left my refuge with my aunt and returned to the ministry a frightful solitude then reigned at versailles the only noise that was heard in the chateau was that of the doors the blinds and the window shutters which were being closed for the first time since the reign of louis the fourteenth my husband made all arrangements for the defence of the chateau being convinced that as soon as night arrived the strange and sinister figures which he saw roaming around the streets and the courts would come together to pillage the chateau alarmed for my safety in view of the disorder which he foresaw he insisted that i should leave with my aunt we were not willing to go to paris because of the fear that the gates would be closed upon us and that i would find myself separated from my husband without the power of rejoining him my wish would have been to remain at versailles as near to my husband i had no fear but he said that my presence would paralyze the efforts which it was his duty to make to show himself worthy of the king's confidence finally he persuaded me to set out for saint germain and to await events in the apartment of monsieur de lally at the chateau this apartment was that of my family which my great-aunt mademoiselle dillon had left him entirely furnished we made the trip in a wretched carriole my aunt and i accompanied by a femme de chambre originally from saint germain the horses and carriages of my father-in-law had been sent to paris and it was impossible to find at versailles any other means of transport no matter what sum was offered the trip took us three long hours end of chapter ten b of part one part one chapter eleven of recollections of the revolution and the empire this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain seventeen eighty nine to seventeen ninety visit to switzerland at the end of two weeks i left for paris where i stayed with my aunt rouveneuil until the hotel de choiseul which had been set apart for the war department was ready my father-in-law was temporarily quartered in a house which belonged i think to the menu plaisir near the louvre every day i went there to dine with him and to do the honours of his salon my aunt had persuaded monsieur lally over whom she exercised an absolute control to abandon the national assembly after the revolution of the sixth of october she also forced him to leave france with monsieur mounier they both retired to switzerland this was a very false move it was to desert their post on the eve of battle however this may be she followed monsieur lally to switzerland and it was at this time that she persuaded him to marry his former mistress miss halkett niece of lord loughborough who was then lord chancellor of england it was only for the purpose of legitimatizing the daughter whom he had had by this woman several years before that he decided to espouse her 
for he had for her neither esteem nor love. But at the moment of leaving Lausanne to rejoin Miss Halkett at Turin, he was taken ill with a terrible attack of smallpox, of which he nearly died. The marriage was therefore adjourned, and did not take place until the following year. At the beginning of winter we went to take up our quarters at the Hôtel de Choiseul. It was a superb mansion in which I had a charming apartment entirely distinct from that of my father-in-law, with which it was connected, however, by a door into one of the salons. A fine separate staircase led to my quarters, which were like a separate house with a view upon the gardens, which today are all built up. My husband, who was entrusted by his father with many important matters, was very much occupied. I saw him only at luncheon, which we took together, and at dinner. My father-in-law ceased to give large dinners when we were in Paris. The dinner hour was four o'clock. An hour after dinner, after having chatted in the salon with several persons who came for coffee, according to the custom at Versailles, my father-in-law returned to his cabinet. I then went back to my own apartment, whence I went out to take part in social functions. On arriving in Paris, the Queen had given up her theatre boxes. On this act of spite, which was natural but also very ill-advised, had still further turned the Parisians against her. This unfortunate princess had no tact, or did not wish to employ it. She openly showed her dislike to those whose presence displeased her, and giving way in this manner to feelings of which she did not weigh the consequences, she injured the interests of the king. Although endowed with great courage, she had very little esprit, no address, and above all a lack of confidence generally unwarranted with regard to those who were the most disposed to serve her. After the 6th of October, failing to appreciate that the terrible danger which had menaced her was the result of a plot woven by the Duc de Léon, she let her resentment fall upon all the inhabitants of Paris indiscriminately, and avoided every occasion to appear in public. I missed very much the privilege of using the Queen's boxes, and fearing the crowd, I was not present at any performances during the winter of 1789 and 1790. I often brought together eight or ten persons in my apartment for little suppers, in which my father-in-law did not take part, for he retired at an early hour and arose very early in the morning. It was during the first months of 1790 that the demagogues employed all their means to corrupt the army. Every day bad news was received, and my poor father-in-law was nearly overwhelmed with the labour caused by these reports. Many officers left France without leave, and this example of indiscipline, of which the other officers took advantage, encouraged the revolt. The 19th of May was born my eldest son, who was baptised in the parish of Saint-Eustache, and received the name of Humbert. My aunt, Madame Denine, who had come from Switzerland, was the godmother, and my father-in-law was the godfather. At Paris, the court was still conducted in accordance with the customs of Versailles, with the exception of the mass which had been abandoned. Dinner was served as at Versailles. As soon as I was able to leave the house, I paid a visit to the Queen in full costume, and was received by her with great kindness. In leaving for Switzerland, Madame Denin had resigned her position, and the question came up, as to whether I should take her place in the Queen's service. The Queen, however, was not in favour of this, because there was already talk of appointing my husband a minister to Holland, and as I would naturally accompany him, the Queen did not think it was worth while if my service was to be interrupted so soon. Besides, said she, 
who knows that I may not expose you to dangers like those of the 5th of October. I no longer recall the reasons which inspired the idea of having all the military corps of the state to fraternise, as they called it then, by sending to Paris the oldest of each grade to be present at the 14th of July, the anniversary of the taking of the Bastille. The National Guards, which had been organised throughout the kingdom during the year, were to send deputations composed of the officers of the highest rank. The preparatory work for receiving them was begun at the end of June. The Champ de Mars, facing the Eco Militaire, at this time presented the appearance of a well-levelled lawn, on which were held the exercises of the pupils of the school and the manoeuvres of the regiments of the Garde Française. At that time there was no garrison, either at Paris or in the environs. The Garde Française were the only body of troops in the city, and their number did not exceed, I think, 2,000 men at the most. They furnished a detachment at Versailles, which was changed every week. At Courbevoie there was quartered the regiment of Swiss Guards, which was never seen at Paris. The Garde du Corps were composed of four companies, of which only one was in service at Versailles. The others occupied the neighbouring cities, Chartres, Beauvais and Saint-Germain. No other body of troops ever appeared, either at Versailles or at Paris, where the only uniforms you saw were those of the sergent recruteur for the different regiments. My husband had been instructed by his father to look after all the deputations and to arrange for their board and lodging as well as their amusements, for all the theatres had orders to reserve free places for the old soldiers and boxes for the officers. A large number were lodged in the Invalide and the École Militaire. The people of Paris took part enthusiastically in the work undertaken at the Champ de Mars, all was finished in two weeks. Finally, on the evening of the 13th of July, my sister-in-law, who had just arrived at Paris, and myself, went to take up our quarters of the École Militaire in a little apartment looking out upon the Champ de Mars, so as to be at hand the following morning. My father-in-law had sent in a fine repast and provisions, so as to offer a substantial déjeuner to the soldiers who might have the intention of coming to see us during the ceremony. This precaution was all the more necessary because, at the Tuileries, they had forgotten to bring anything for the king's children, and the Dauphin was very glad to share our collation. The poor little prince wore the uniform of the National Guard, to which nearly everyone at that time belonged. In society, all the men under fifty years of age had had their names inscribed and performed very faithfully their service. Monsieur de Lafayette, who has been so much condemned, did not then think of a republic for France, whatever may have been the ideas as to this kind of government that he brought back from America. He desired as much as any of us the establishment of a wise liberty and the abolition of abuses. But I'm certain that he had not at that time the least idea or desire of overturning the throne, and that he never had such a thought. The unbounded hatred which the Queen had for him, and which she showed every time that she dared, nevertheless caused him as much chagrin as was possible in the case of a character which was soft even to foolishness. Yet Lafayette was not weak as his conduct under the empire has well proved. He resisted all the approaches, all the offers, and even the cajolery of Napoleon. The restoration showed itself very unjust towards him. The Duchesse d'Anguilene had inherited from her mother the hatred which the Queen bore him. But to return to the Federation of 1790. The altar had been erected in the Champ de Mars, and a mass was celebrated by the least respectable of the French priests. The Abbé de Perigord, since Prince Talleyrand, had been designated as Bishop of Autun, 
when Monsieur Marboeuf was transferred to the Diocese of Lyon. The King, however, justly offended by his ecclesiastical conduct, refused to confirm the appointment. In this refusal, the King showed a firmness very different from his ordinary character, but aroused on this occasion by his conscience. However, when the Comte de Talleyrand, father of the Abbé, was upon his deathbed and demanded as a last favour this appointment, which the King had previously refused, he no longer made any opposition, and the Abbé de Perigord was appointed Bishop of Autun. It was he who celebrated the Mass of the Federation of 1790. No words can give an idea of this pageant. The troops, arranged in order in the middle of the arena, the multitude of different uniforms mingled with those of the National Guard, brilliant from their newness, all this constituted one of the most surprising spectacles which you could possibly see, and which I enjoyed from the windows of the École Militaire, where I was located. In front of the middle balcony had been constructed a fine tribune, highly decorated. The unfortunate royal family this day comprised the King, the Queen, their two children, Madame Elizabeth, the sister of the King, and the Comte and Comtesse de Provence. As I was still very weak, I did not descend to the royal tribune. Nevertheless, I was near the Queen when she passed, and accustomed for a long time to the expression of her face, I saw that she was making great efforts to conceal her ill humour, without succeeding well enough for either her own interests or for those of the King. Towards the end of July 1790, my health was quite well re-established. My aunt wished to return to Lausanne, and my husband, knowing my desire to see Switzerland, gave me permission to make a trip of six weeks. Madame de Valence was at this time at Secheron, near Geneva, with Madame de Montesson, who passed the summer there. It was arranged that I should join her and pass some time with her in the little house which was separate from that of my aunt. I left my son with his nurse and Marguerite at the Hôtel de la Guerre. As my maid could not accompany me, I took with me only one servant. I travelled by a little chaise de poste, for calèche were not then known. My aunt and I were furnished with all possible passports for the civil authorities, as well as for the National Guards and the military authorities. An act of imprudence on the part of my aunt nearly cost us very dear. The post where we were to change horses at Dole was outside the city upon the route to Besançon. Accordingly, we passed through the city by a quiet street without any trouble. Arrived at the post, my aunt inquired of the maître de poste if this route led to Geneva. He replied that to take the route to Geneva, that of the Rues, it was necessary to recross the city. In vain I suggested to my aunt that our passport stated that we were to leave France by Pontalier. She said that was of no importance, and as soon as the horses were attached, gave the order to turn back and recross the city to gain the route of Rues, under the pretext that she had given a rendezvous at Geneva to Monsieur Lally. Accordingly, we re-entered the city. We were ignorant of the fact that it was necessary to pass through the market, which was being held upon a large square. Forced to go at a walk in order to avoid the market baskets and the persons in the street, we were received with abuse. Suddenly a voice exclaimed, C'est la reine! At once we were stopped, our horses were unhitched, our courier was dragged from his horse, and there were cries of, À la lanterne! They opened the door of the carriage and ordered us to descend, which we did, not without fear. I stated that I was the daughter of the Minister of War, and demanded that they should take me to the commander of the place, or send to look for him. My aunt said that she had a letter from Monsieur Lafayette for the commander of the National Guard. There is his house, cried someone. 
and we saw two sentinels at a door over which floated a large tricoloured flag. It was only a few steps away, and my aunt and I entered the house, where the crowd of people did not dare to follow us. We went through an antechamber without finding anyone. From there we entered a dining room where there was a table laid out with seven or eight covers. The guests had left precipitately, and two or three overturned chairs testified to the haste with which they had disappeared. My aunt refused to go farther, but rang a bell which she had noticed in the hope that someone would appear. As we'd had no déjeuner, we sat down at the table and commenced to eat the dinner which had been abandoned. An excellent meal satisfied our hunger, while we laughed over the adventure and the cowardice of the chief of the National Guard. Finally, after waiting three hours, there entered a grave personage, a kind of fat bourgeois, accompanied by two or three other men. This individual addressed my aunt and demanded her name. Then, pointing to me, he said, This young lady is your daughter? She replied that I was the daughter-in-law of the Minister of War, that I knew that there was a regiment of cavalry in garrison at Dole, that I wished to speak to the commander who would arrange without doubt with the president of the commune that we should be set at liberty. The person who had approached us stated that he himself was the president of the commune. My aunt, seeing that they wished to keep us prisoners, suggested as a means of clearing the matter up that a servant should be sent as a courier to Paris, and demanded that while waiting his return we should be authorised to establish ourselves at an inn. One of the members of the commune who accompanied the president promised to take us to his house. This asylum seemed more certain than an inn, where we might be insulted by the people. Upon our consenting, he offered me his arm, and leaving this inhospitable house, where we had eaten our dinner without invitation, we were conducted by our host to a mansion where we were lodged in rooms which, although common, were quite good. Here we were rejoined by the maid and our three servants. We at once wrote to Paris about our misadventure, my aunt to Monsieur de Lafayette, and I to my husband. Our host advised us not to attempt to go out, and we resigned ourselves to remaining in this dismal lodging on the ground floor, looking out on a very small garden with the sun hardly penetrated at midday. The next morning two members of the commune came to interrogate us. They asked a thousand questions and examined our papers and writing portfolios. They demanded an account of everything we had in our chaise de poste, and also why I had so many new shoes, if I was only going to pass six weeks in Switzerland, as I had stated, and hundreds of other similar absurdities which caused me to laugh in their faces. Finally the thought occurred to me to say to them that the officers of the city sent to Paris to the Federation, and who ought to be back with their regiment, having probably dined with my father-in-law, would recognise me. This idea appeared to them a brilliant one, and they went to look for the officers. Towards the end of our first day of seclusion there arrived the officers of the Royal Etranger, who offered me the services of their protection. I prayed the officers to conceal their dissatisfaction, but I could not prevent them from coming every day to call one after another. At the end of the fourth day, the members of the municipality made up their minds that they had made a foolish mistake in arresting us and gave us permission to set out. It required several hours to repack our carriages, and as we wished to stop for the night at Nyon, we resolved not to set out before the next morning at five o'clock. The next day, with many thanks to the officers for their politeness, we took the road for the Jura. Our triumph came that very evening. The President of the National Assembly wrote the Mayor, or President of the Commune, by a courier sent expressly a very strong reprimand on account of our arrest. 
Monsieur de Lafayette also sent a message to the commander of the National Guard. My father-in-law entrusted our safety to the lieutenant-colonel commanding the place. For our part, we were glad to escape by a prompt retreat from the honours which they wished to shower upon us to make up for our unjust attention. We arrived at Nyon at midnight, having passed the frontier without difficulty. My aunt did not find Monsieur Lally there. He was at Secheron, where it was arranged that we should go the next morning. The next day we arrived at Secheron, where we found Monsieur Lally and Monsieur Mounier, here I received letters from my husband, who seemed to be disturbed by the revolt of several garrisons in Lorraine, in particular of that of Nancy. This news, however, did not arouse my anxiety. M. Mounier persuaded my aunt to make a visit to Chamonix, and we set out the next day and did not return to Geneva before the end of five or six days. On our return to Secheron, I found a letter from my husband which had been forwarded to me from Lausanne, where he thought I was with my aunt. He announced his departure for Nancy to carry orders from the king to Monsieur de Bouillet. Their tenor was that he should unite several French and Swiss regiments and march on Nancy. At Rolle, where we stopped to refresh our horses, we learned at the inn that Monsieur Plantemour of Geneva was there and that he was en route for Nancy. My aunt asked to speak to him in private. In a few minutes he entered the room where I was, and I observed that he was very much troubled, which increased my anxiety. He told me that there had been fighting at Nancy, but that details were lacking. We continued our route to Lausanne, and on arriving there, Monsieur Lally, who had preceded us, gave me several letters from my husband, written after his return to Paris. In these letters he told me everything which had occurred at Nancy. As these details belong to the domain of history, I shall not relate them here. While these events were happening at Nancy, I was at Lausanne, where I passed two weeks, and enjoyed myself very much. Here I encountered a celebrated person, Mr. Gibbon, whose grotesque face gave me such a desire to laugh that it was difficult to control myself. There were also many émigrés at Lausanne, as I did not enjoy myself in their society. As soon as Madame Montesson was established at Paqui, near Geneva, I hastened to rejoin her and went to lodge with Madame Valence in a little house distinct from that of Madame Montesson. The inn of Secheron was then very popular. Many of the émigrés whom I knew were settled there for the summer. Several young men, after having accompanied the Comte d'Artois to Turin, already tied to Piedmont, had come to Switzerland. Fortunately, I remained only three or four weeks at Geneva, or rather Paquis. My husband came to join me and take me back to Paris. As he was in a hurry and wished to return by way of Alsace in order to meet Monsieur Bouillet, we left Geneva at an early hour in the morning so as to have several hours to visit Berne and Bâle. Monsieur Bouillet came to meet us between Ernang and Neufbrisac, and I waited patiently in the carriage while my husband talked with him in walking up and down the highway. After a morning devoted to Strasbourg, we passed the night at Saverne, and from there went to Nancy. From Nancy we made the trip to Paris without stopping. And upon my return, I found my dear boy in good health and looking well and handsome. End of part one, chapter eleven.